Hello, my name is Eric Strong, and I am a hospitalist at the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and an affiliated assistant professor of medicine at Stanford University. This is the first lecture in this course on understanding ABGs, or the arterial blood gas. In this lecture, I will first be giving a brief overview of the course as a whole. Then, I will provide a summary of what an ABG is, how it's obtained, and what information it contains. The audience of this lecture series is intended to be medical house staff and critical care nurses, as well as motivated students in medicine, nursing, and respiratory therapy, all of whom will, at some point, be involved in the care of critically ill patients. I will be assuming only a basic background in physiology, and I will fill in additional relevant details as necessary along the way. I can imagine that you might initially feel that several hours of instruction on the ABG is a bit much. Perhaps you were looking for a 10-minute crash course, or maybe you didn't realize ABGs were such a complicated topic. However, my goal with this course is to provide you with everything you could ever possibly need to know about ABGs in order to take care of and treat complex, critically ill patients. Please note that these lectures are for educational purposes only and are not intended to direct the care of any specific patient. No video can supersede the opinion of an experienced and licensed healthcare professional. Having said that, I hope you find these videos both interesting and useful. Please feel welcome to submit feedback after viewing them. Here is the lecture outline for this course. First, Lectures 1 through 7 will focus on some background acid-base physiology and the basic algorithm for identifying pathophysiologic states of acid-base imbalance. Lectures 8 through 12 will review the differential diagnosis for the five major categories of acid-base disorders. Lecture 13 will summarize the common general approach to acid-base analysis, while Lecture 14 will review some common pitfalls and practical issues not addressed by the general approach. Lecture 15 will present an alternative approach to the common algorithm, one based on the Stewart model. Lectures 16 through 19 will shift gears and focus on using the ABG to diagnose problems with oxygenation. Finally, the 20th lecture will cover how to put everything you've already learned to use in analyzing complex clinical scenarios that involve simultaneous abnormalities of both acid-base balance and the gas exchange. By the end of this course, you should be able to accurately interpret any ABG, including being able to establish a likely differential diagnosis given a specific clinical scenario. Throughout these lectures, I will be presenting the most commonly employed approach to analyzing ABGs. At times, it may seem particularly protocolized with an established and invariant algorithm, and it may be tempting to take the simple numbers from the ABG and quickly run through a set of rules to get some definitive answer. However, many of the rules we will be using were initially derived decades ago from small studies involving only healthy human volunteers. Therefore, I would caution against interpreting any ABG too dogmatically. In other words, don't forget about the patient in front of you by focusing too heavily on abstract numbers. Although I will be working through dozens of examples during this course, Mastery of ABG interpretation will only happen if you practice it on your own. Watching someone else solve problems will be helpful, but it won't be sufficient. Therefore, I would encourage you to intermittently pause these lectures as I go over individual examples and attempt to first reach the answer yourself. The remainder of this lecture will give a very brief grand overview of the ABG. The learning objective is to be familiar with the values that are obtained from the ABG along with aspects of physiology that each value can help to better understand. The arterial blood gas is a specific collection of lab tests run on a sample of arterial blood, which is most importantly inclusive of the arterial pH, the partial pressure of oxygen, abbreviated PaO2, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, abbreviated PaCO2. Here is a patient having an ABG drawn through a puncture in the radial artery, which is the typical location for this, though it can also be drawn through the femoral artery if absolutely necessary. An ABG can also be drawn through an arterial line, 
particularly in intubated ICU patients, where serial samples can be drawn and compared without the need for additional punctures. The blood is then injected into a small cartridge, which is usually fed into a handheld ABG analyzer. This is a picture of the iStat, one particular model of ABG analyzer, which is one of the most commonly used such devices in the United States. Depending on the exact model of analyzer and on the type of cartridge used, the ABG can provide an array of various measurements. In addition to the three I just mentioned, it also always includes the bicarbonate level as well as the arterial O2 saturation of hemoglobin. What do we do with these values, you might ask? The pH, PA, CO2, and bicarb is used in determining the acid-base status of the patient. That is, whether the pH of arterial blood is normal, too acidemic, or too alkalemic. These values are related via the henderson hasselbalch equation, which will be discussed a bit in Lecture 2. Next, the PaCO2 alone tells us about the status of the patient's ventilation. It does this through the alveolar ventilation equation that states the partial pressure of CO2 in arterial blood is equal to the product of the rate of systemic CO2 production and pressure of inspired air divided by alveolar ventilation. Therefore, if the PaCO2 can be measured, the systemic CO2 production is usually assumed based on the situation and pressure of inspired air is also known, then alveolar ventilation can be calculated. Alveolar ventilation is in turn determined by the respiratory rate, tidal volume, and dead space. Finally, the PaCO2, PaO2, and the O2 saturation tell us about the patient's oxygenation. The alveolar gas equation allows one to calculate the alveolar oxygen tension, denoted here as P big A O2. The difference between the calculated P big A O2 and the measured P little a O2 is an important physiologic parameter known as the AA gradient, which provides important information regarding the adequacy of a patient's alveolar arterial membrane through which oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse. One last point about these values from the ABG concerns how they are determined by the machine. So the big three, that is the pH, the PaCO2, and the P little a O2, are all measured directly. The bicarb is calculated using the henderson hasselbalch equation, and the O2 sat is calculated using a complicated nomogram relating PaO2 and temperature. So overall, while the ABG basically contains just five values, it provides critical information about a patient's gas exchange and systemic metabolic pathways. It is an essential tool for diagnosing and prognosticating an extremely wide variety of pathologic conditions. The next lecture will discuss normal acid-base regulation in the body, knowledge of which will be necessary for understanding how to use the ABG for diagnosing abnormalities of acid-base balance.